In war, there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor, for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to Wallbuilders Live. This is the intersection of faith and politics. You can find out more about our program at our website, wallbuilderslive.com and wallbuilders.com. At wallbuilderslive.com, you can actually get a list of our 200 stations around the nation. Find out if there's one local to you. And if there's not, hey, take some links from our program, send them out to those talk stations in your area, and ask them to pick up Wallbuilders Live so you can listen anywhere and everywhere. But you can get us online, you can get us a podcast, and uh, you can also look at the archives and get some programs from the past few months, including our Good News Fridays, and on Thursdays, we do a lot of Constitution talk, studying the Declaration of Constitution there on Foundations of Freedom Thursday. All right, for today, we're actually going to be diving into a three-part series with George Barna. Now, if you're not familiar with George Barna, you need to be. This guy is amazing. His research is incredible. And the number of books this guy has written just blows my mind. We had him on, I guess, I don't know, five or six months ago on the radio program about another topic and uh, talked about that. He's written 48 books. I don't know how somebody turns out so much information, and it's not uh, light information. I mean, this guy dives into the details of what is happening in the culture, and he also deals with some uh, some very personal issues. Uh, I, I read a book that he did on parenting that was just phenomenal. It's called Revolutionary Parenting, and he and he takes the data and the information that they gain through uh, intensive research and surveys and really spending time with people, not just a a telephone poll, but actually going and and visiting with people and really diving in deep. And he takes that data and and that information, and he helps empower people. Uh, For instance, like me as a parent, his book helped to empower me to make better decisions as a parent and to recognize some of the things that I needed to adjust and, and change and some of the things that I wanted to reinforce that his data clearly showed worked well with young people. So that's just an example, though, just the parenting. I mean, he does everything from from politics to, to churches to um, uh, you name it. I mean, he, he covered it to your own uh, personal uh, mission and, and, and purpose and, and vision. So just a, a ton of great information. I encourage you to visit his website, Barna.org. That's B-A-R-N-A dot org. And uh, we're going to get to have uh, George Barna with us for the next three days here on Wild Builders Live. It's a presentation that he gave uh, several weeks back at our Pro Family Legislators Conference. And I got to tell you, he had those legislators spellbound with the data that he's going to share with you. Some pretty shocking information about where the culture really stands right now. Um, You know, it's unfortunate, but I think sometimes we stick our heads in the sand and and, and we just pray that it's not as bad as sometimes we think it might be. We hope that, that the anecdotal stories we hear about uh, things that are happening in the culture. We hope they're anecdotal, that they're not becoming the rule, uh, that hopefully they're still the exception to the rule. And i got to tell you, the stuff he's going to share in the next three days is uh, it's going to wake you up, and it's going to make you uh, realize that you cannot sit on the sidelines and hope that the culture gets better. Every one of us has got to take an active role in returning to the principles that made America great in the first place, and George Barna is a master at helping us identify that, though those principles, identify where we're losing those principles, and then help us shape the message that we are teaching to the next generation. So you're going to really enjoy this. It's a three-part series. If for some reason you're not going to be able to listen to the program in the next couple of days, don't worry. It'll all be online by the end of the three days, and you can actually take all three days and share them with your friends. But before we go to the conference and actually hear from George Barna, let me just tell you a little bit more about him. He's a native New Yorker. He's uh, been in uh, major executive roles in politics, marketing, advertising, media research, and in ministry. So just about every area of the culture. You've heard about the Seven Mountains, or as David and I like to talk about, the the five different major cultural areas. Well, this guy's been involved in almost every single one of them. Uh, His research is used by churches, by people in the uh, the political realm, by nonprofits, and uh, and even in the the military uses a lot of his research as well. As I mentioned earlier, 48 different books. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read all of them, but the ones I have read, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed and learned an awful lot from. He is frequently cited as an authoritative source, uh, even by the media, uh, let alone by folks like David Barton and myself and so many others that greatly respect 
for what he does. Many, many, many pastors use his research as well. He's a popular speaker around the world. Uh, a graduate of Boston College, has two master's degrees from Rutgers University, and uh, he and his wife live out in California, and he's just a phenomenal guy. We are uh, uh, honored to call him a friend and uh, really excited about bringing his presentation to you here on Wobblers Live. Let's go join those legislators and listen to George Barna. I can't believe there are still people here. It's always great to be the eighth speaker in a row. You know, it's, it's, wow. You all deserve an award. That's great. Thank you so much. They're flashing my time at me already. They didn't like that, so it's... Uh, well, anyway, it is, thank you very much, David. It is a privilege to be here. Uh, it, it's really kind of cool for me to be here, too. I got my start in the working world right after college. I became a legislative aide and then a chief of staff in the uh, Massachusetts State Legislature. After that, I worked as a pollster for candidates running for Congress, for State Assembly, uh, citywide offices, uh, gubernatorial races, those kinds of things. I got out of that, went back to New Jersey, and uh, worked at the Eagleton Institute of Politics as a research analyst for a few years. And while I was there, picked up a couple of master's degrees, one of which was in political science with a concentration in survey research, the other of which was a master's in uh, urban planning with a concentration in social policy development. So you're my kind of people. I, I really feel good about being here. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share some thoughts with you. What I thought I'd talk about today was uh, something titled, What the Polls Teach Us About Pro-Family Policymaking. And toward that end, I'm going to share with you uh, information from three different areas. Uh, the first of those, I'm going to make a, a few brief comments about survey research itself, primarily about how polls can and should be used as a tool in what you do in creating policy. Uh, secondly, I'll briefly, very briefly, go through some of the current data uh, related to two particular issues that are of interest to all of us, abortion and same-sex marriage. But I want to spend the bulk of my time putting all of that kind of information into a context that hopefully will give you a better understanding of exactly why it is so difficult to pass laws that matter, to get things through the legislature and through the entire gauntlet that, uh, that policies have to run to become law. And in order to do that, I'm going to spend most of my time dissecting the death of the American dream. Hey, this is Tim Barton with Wall Builders. And as you've had the opportunity to listen to Wall Builders Live, you've probably heard the wealth of information about our nation, about our spiritual heritage, about the religious liberties, about all the things that makes America exceptional. And you might be thinking, as incredible as this information is, I wish there was a way that I could get one of the Wall Builders guys to come to my area and share with my group, whether it be a church, whether it be a Christian school or public school or some political event or activity. If you're interested in having a Wall Builder speaker come to your area, you can get on our website at www.wallbuilders.com and there's a tab for scheduling and if you'll click on that tab you'll notice there's a list of information from speakers bios to events that are already going on and there's a section where you can request an event to bring this information about who we are where we came from our religious liberties and freedoms go to the wall builders website and bring a speaker to your area Let me start off, first of all, with this, uh, well, a few observations related to survey research and polling as it pertains to what you do. First thing I want to encourage you to do is to be a wise and discerning consumer of research. Because as a research professional, professional, someone who's been doing this for years, I will tell you that my assessment is that most of the publicly released surveys that you see, whether it's in the newspapers, whether it's in things circulated uh, from office to office at the State House, most surveys are garbage. Now, the reason that I say that is not because I want to make disparaging comments about my colleagues in the profession. I, I don't do that. Uh, it, it's not my job to put down other people, but I think it is my job as a teller of truth to indicate to you that when you tear apart most of the research that's done and you look at things like question wording, question sequencing, sampling, 
data analysis, data collection, uh, quality control, all of those kinds of things, what you begin to find is that there is an incredible amount of very sloppy research that's done. Sometimes it's sloppy for a purpose the purpose of distorting information to sell an idea using those numbers. So you've got to be very careful about whose information you use. You cannot assume that all polls are of equal value or even of any value. You have to understand, you have to dig a little bit deeper to figure out what it is that you're looking for. A second thing that I'd suggest to you is that you have to understand what the purpose of polls are. And it's my observation from my time with policymakers over the last 30 years that your duty as a lawmaker is not to be popular so that you get reelected. Your duty is to do what is right. You serve a much higher power. You serve the people, but you serve the people on behalf of God. And so you've got to always be apprised of what is the right thing to do because the best way that you can serve people is by doing what's right. And so thinking about polls, how do they fit into this? Well, they ought to help you better understand how to do what's right by understanding what the public may be thinking at any given moment and helping you to develop strategy and messaging that will persuade them to understand what the right thing to do is. I can tell you from having done national research now for about 30 years, most Americans don't have a clue what the right thing is on almost any issue for reasons that I'll describe in a few moments. It is your job as their elected representative, someone whom they have called to lead, not to simply read polls and say, but the people seem to want. The people don't know what they want. And so you have to help them understand that better. The polls are just a, a, a tool in that regard. To give you some sense of, of how that works, you have to understand that currently in our society, we are flooded with information, but we are thirsty for knowledge. We've got more information than we've ever had. You know that. But look at some of the things that Americans currently believe or know or don't know, as the case may be. Two out of three Americans cannot name a single Supreme Court justice. There is higher name recall for Yao Ming, the retired Chinese NBA player, than there is for Xi Jinping, the president and premier of China. Two out of three people never heard of common cause or the standards thereof. Only one out of three people know that the federal government spends more money on social programs than the military. It's by more than a three to one margin. Most people think it's the reverse. Just one out of every six Americans know that the top 1% of households in our country, in terms of income, actually pay more taxes than middle class households. They've been led to believe the opposite. Only one out of three Americans recognize that the air in America is less polluted today than it was in the 1980s. They have all kinds of opinions. And one of the things I've learned over 30 years is if you ask Americans a question, they will give you an answer whether they know the answer or not because it's important to them to seem like they're in the game. And so they will tell you whatever it is they've heard, whatever they think, whatever they can grab onto that seems like a reasonable answer so they don't come across as an idiot. Understand, not only do they not understand much about what's going on, but they are not really involved in the process. When we look at what goes on in politics, we know that Americans generally are uninvolved and proud of it. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Today, numerous court decisions demonstrate that there's often a conflict between the courts, the law, and religion. Has this conflict always existed? Not according to James Wilson. James Wilson was a signer of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He was a law professor as well as an original justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. James Wilson saw no conflict between religion and the law. In fact, just the contrary. He declared... Human law must rest its authority, ultimately, upon the authority of that law which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends, and mutual assistants. Indeed, these two sciences run into each other. In the views of founding father James Wilson, religion and good civil law were inseparable. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD.
when we look at some some recent data, what we find is that in 2012 and 2013, only one out of every seven signed or circulated a petition. One out of every eight has contacted an elected official. One out of every 16 has asked for information from a candidate, a party, or an issue coalition. One out of every 20 has donated money to any candidates for office. One out of every 33 has attended any kind of a campaign event. One out of every 50 has volunteered or worked on behalf of a candidate, party, or issue. And one out of every 50 has, has uh, participated in or attended some kind of an organized public protest. This is not the profile of a people who are excited, enthusiastic about, and engaged with the political process. And so therefore, you, again, you have to be very careful about this. Your job, therefore, is to steward the law, not simply to become a public opinion doormat. You are not supposed to be shaped by public opinion. As a leader, you should shape it. And so, therefore, you have a very different function. See, I think all of this, uh, you know, underscores the duty of a lawmaker. Part of it is to educate the public. Part of it is to care for them, all under the framework of doing what's right and what's best for the people. See, because one of the things that I know, and, and I've seen it done time after time after time every year since I've been in this business, is that you can find polls or you can create polls to say whatever you want them to say. You can distort the public's understanding of an issue through the use of cleverly designed and analyzed research. And so, for instance, you could take a subject like abortion, and we could look at two high-profile polling organizations. We could look at Gallup, and we could look at AP, which recently has been using GFK as their research firm. GFK is a worldwide, it's a global research firm, high-profile, huge income, a lot of professionals work in there all over the globe. But what you find is if you look at the Gallup data, they ask the questions differently than the AP data, the, the studies done by GFK for AP. Uh, what you find is that the questions come out very different. Uh, the answers come out different because they ask the questions differently. So what gets reported is, is something very different. You see, the Gallup folks broke it down, and they found out that currently about a quarter of Americans say that they believe that abortion should be legal only in certain circumstances that are enumerated in their question. 52 percent, I'm sorry, 26 percent say it should be legal in all circumstances. About half the public says, well, there might be certain circumstances, uh, you know, the health of the mother or whatever, where you might have to legalize abortion. 20 percent say there are no circumstances in which you should legalize it. You look at the AP poll, which of course is the one that gets reported around the world, and you get a very different reading where they say 54% the majority of Americans believe that abortion should be legal in all or some circumstances. And 42% uh, say it should be illegal in some or most circumstances. You're analyzing two very different things. You've given people different options. It comes out differently. But you can tell the story however you want, picking or choosing whichever polls. And, of course, there are, there are dozens of polls that ask these kinds of questions. You can just keep surfing the Internet until you find the poll you like, and then you run with that one. So if you are in a race for office, if you are dealing with the media, whatever it may be, you've got to understand that landscape so that when somebody starts throwing figures at you, you know where that comes from and why they came out that way, as well as understanding what it is that you're proposing. Finding skilled and ethical researchers, I've discovered in my industry, is not an easy thing to do. So you've got to be careful. But second thing we said we'd talk about is where do things appear to stand today. Now, one thing that I've done over the years is I've tried to get to know a lot of the different survey firms and their techniques and some of their people and understand who can I trust. And it's a very small list. One, one of the players on that list is the Gallup organization. They've had problems over the years, but one thing that I really appreciate about, appreciate about them is that they immediately deal with those problems because they want to tell the truth. I think this is part of the legacy of the Gallup family. Uh, George Gallup essentially was one of the founders of the industry. He passed it on to his son, George Jr. Both of them being Christians, devoted Christians. George Jr. actually went to seminary for a while before dropping out and then getting in the family business. Truth was an important thing to them. 
And so even though they sold the company probably a dozen years ago, that mentality continues to reside within the company. What do we know that the Gallup polls recently have found uh, on these two issues that I've, uh, I've chosen to talk uh, very briefly about? Red, White, Blue, and Green is a new reality show following the Green family around the nation rediscovering the American principles that made us the most successful nation in the history of the world. You can be a part of launching this new reality series by visiting rickgreen.com and clicking on the Red, White, Blue, and Green tab. Here's a sneak peek from the pilot episode. Rick Green coming to you live from the Lone Star State of Texas, a beacon of hope and freedom to liberty lovers around the world. Today I'm, I'm thinking about why... Why do we do what we do? Because everywhere we go as a family, when we're traveling and speaking, someone comes up to us and asks, where's the hope? Is it over for America? They genuinely feel like the stars and stripes are fading. I felt that. But when I look at my family, whether it's my son, Trey, and his drive to exceed expectations, or, or Reagan and, and, and his love for serving and, and teaching other people, Cameron and her determination to outperform her brothers in everything she does, or, or my little stagehound, Rhett, and his boundless enthusiasm. Through their eyes, I see a vibrant nation. When my children stand in the birthplace of the Constitution or on battlefields where patriots gave their lives, I can see in them a rekindled flame of the American spirit. The future of my children's country is bright because it's built on the foundation of an incredible providential history. A history of patriots and pastors, entrepreneurs and freedom fighters, mothers, fathers, families like yours and mine who chose to live like their nation depended on it. And it still does. So when people ask us, where is the hope? We tell them, it's in you. Each of us, every individual, every family, has a duty to fight for freedom and add our voice, our color, to the American dream. For our family, it's red, white, and blue, and a little bit of green. To learn more about red, white, blue, and green, visit rickgreen.com. We can look first of all at opinions related to abortion. And I'll just quickly tell you a few things. This is not the purpose of my speaking here today. I wanted to give you some context or or some information so that the context I give you in the next portion will make more sense. But what we know from the Gallup data is, for instance, uh, and they've been studying this uh, for the last 35 or 40 years, Three quarters of all Americans believe that uh, we should legalize abortion in some cases or all cases. Again, they break it down different ways. We know that their research shows that the population, the adult population, is split between identifying themselves as either pro-life or pro-choice. This, by the way, is a big difference from the way that it was uh, just 15 years ago when a much larger proportion of Americans designated themselves as pro-choice. So there's been significant movement in that. We find that uh, most American adults assume that most other adults are pro-choice, which comes back to the influence of the media and and what they would have Americans believe. We know that, by the way, our research at the Barna Group has shown it's the same way with homosexuality. Three percent of the American population is homosexual. Americans assume today that 25 to 30 percent of Americans are gay. Naturally, all you have to do is watch primetime TV, you know, and it conveys the message that, well, sure, that's just the way America is today. We can look at the fact that, uh, getting back to abortion, we're essentially split on this idea of whether or not the so-called morning after pill should be legalized. Moral acceptability, currently four out of ten Americans believe that abortion is a moral behavior. Uh, What we also know is that Americans are uh, looking at uh, abortion laws and only about one out of four say that they want stricter abortion laws. Only about one out of three say they want Roe versus Wade overturned. And about one out of five adults use a candidate's views on abortion as a litmus test as to whether or not they'll vote for them. 
It's just a little snapshot of where we stand in terms of abortion. If we were to look at same-sex marriage, again, looking at uh, Gallup data, all of these numbers are from within the last 8 to 12 months. Um, what we find is that three out of four Americans say that they personally know somebody, a family member, a friend, or a co-worker, who has come out and declared himself gay or herself a lesbian uh, in recent years. We find that about six out of ten of them say that personally their views on homosexuality and same-sex marriage have not changed uh, over the years. Well, we're out of time for today, folks. We're going to have to interrupt George Barna for a moment, and tomorrow we'll pick up where we left off today. If you're just tuning in or you missed the intro to today's program, we're doing a three-part series with George Barna, amazing guy. you got to check out his website at barna.org and read some of the research there, get his books, and read them. Just phenomenal information, and we're thrilled to be able to have him as a guest at uh, Pro Family Legislators Conference as a speaker for those legislators. That's what you were listening to there. In fact, uh, you should check out that part of our website as well. If you go to wallbuilders.com and check out our events, we have uh, once a year an opportunity for state legislators to come together and exchange ideas. It's a great time for them. It's also good for you as a citizen because it's going to improve your state because it equips those leaders to go back and make good laws, get rid of the bad ones. It's just great information. A lot of great speakers, including George Barna. And we're going to get the rest of George Barna's presentation tomorrow and the next day. So if you're going to miss one of those, be sure and tune back in on the website at wallbuilderslive.com, and you can get the three-part series and share it with your friends. We'll look forward to being with you again tomorrow. Thanks for listening to Wall Builders Live. We stand on this.